Good evening. My name is Manuel Firmino, and you are all welcome to the second Creativity Talk. This initiative was started by the Department of Informatics Engineering of Faculty of Engineering of University of Porto and organized with the faculties of Fine Arts, Humanities, Psychology and Educational Sciences and other institutions. We expect these talks to cover several scientific and artistic areas discussing and studying creativity, helping to promote a proactive attitude in our students and in general, our lives. Each talk will also feature a guest moderator that will in his turn present our speaker, which we are very honored to have today, Patty Maes, Professor of Media Arts and Science at MIT. Our moderator, Luisa Rivers, is an assistant professor of, at the Faculty of Fine Arts University of Lisbon, where she teaches communication design with a focus on the complementary between print and digital media. Her research is devoted to the study of computational system as aesthetic artifacts, their design and experience. She has contributed to several publications on design and digital arts, as well as to the organization of international conferences such as ExcoAx dedicated to computation, communication, and aesthetics. Thank you. Please, Lisa. Thank you so much, Manuel Firmino, for the presentation. Good afternoon to you all. Uh, my name is Luisa Ribas. As you said, um, I teach communication design at the University of Lisbon. And uh, I would also like to welcome you all uh, to this second talk of the series of Creativity Talks. I would like to begin by thanking the University of Porto for the invitation to moderate this talk and congratulate the organizers on this initiative, gathering such leading figures of, on creative thinking and practices as our guest of today, Professor Patti Mas, who I am very pleased to introduce and whom I thank beforehand for being with us today to share her views on enhancing human creativity. So as some of you certainly know, Patti Mas is a professor in MIT's program in Media Arts and Sciences, where she also serves as academic head. Uh, she runs the Media Lab's Fluid Interfaces Research Group, which aims to rethink and reinvent the human-machine interactive experience. So coming from a background in artificial intelligence and human-computer interaction that includes a bachelor's degree in computer science and a, a non-honorary doctorate in artificial intelligence, Mas is also the editor of three books and editorial board member and reviewer for numerous professional journals and conferences. And she's also an active entrepreneur as co-founder of several companies. But you probably also know Patti Mas by her 2009 TED Talk on the Sixth Sense device, which is one of the most watched TED Talks ever, and which already reveals her critical view on the disconnect between our digital and physical experiences and her aim to create fluid or seamless interfaces that can assist us in achieving our goals or overcome our limitation. But a lot has happened since then, and along the way, Mas has gathered several awards. She started already in 1995 when she was awarded the World Wide Web Category Prize, namely by entities such as Fast Company, Newsweek, uh, Time Digital, or the World Economic Forum as well as being featured in numerous lists of influential designers or technological pioneers, which I will not mention all to save you some time, but I'll just add the more recent inclusion on Forbes's list of women in AI to watch. So uh, we are eager to hear and learn from a research on the topic of cog cognitive enhancement and how immersive and wearable systems can actively assist people with memory, attention, learning, decision-making, communication, and well-being, or in particular, creativity. So with no further delay, I give the screen to Patti Mess. Welcome, and thank you for joining. 
questions. Thank you, Louisa, for that introduction. Uh, let me share my screen um, here. So it's a pleasure being here. Um, so I will talk today about uh, the work that myself and, and my group are doing at MIT on augmenting human cognition and creativity. But before I start talking specifically about the research that I'm doing um, uh, at MIT and at the Media Lab, I thought I would give a little bit of an introduction to uh, the Media Laboratory because it's really a unique place um, that is actually highly creative and I believe that there are some uh, sort of um, secret uh, ingredients that we have that make it uh, such a creative place. So I'll uh, start with that and then continue and talk a little bit more about my own work. So I've been a professor at the MIT Media Laboratory uh, for 30 years, and the lab focuses on the intersection of technology and society, or technology and people. Our mission is to benefit society by inventing new technologies and experiences that help people to understand and transform their own lives, their communities, and their environments. We are actually both a research lab and a graduate program. So that building that you just saw is packed uh, with about 400 people, many of whom are uh, graduate students, masters and PhD students, as well as a lot of undergrads from MIT that help us uh, in our research. And um, the lab has uh, over its uh, 35 years of existence, uh, I think been uh, very successful and uh, has produced a lot of, uh, or has had a lot of impact really, uh, not just in the academic world, but also in other areas and in the real world, <laughs> so to speak. And I think that there are a few sort of reasons why the lab has been so successful that um, I think other places can actually try to learn from. One is that <coughs> um, we have a very interdisciplinary team. We tend to attract people um, from all different backgrounds and all different disciplines rather than have all designers or all AI people or all uh, electrical engineers. Uh, so we try to bring in people from many different backgrounds and actually many of the uh, people who work at the lab, both faculty and students, have multiple disciplines that they are passionate about. Uh, for example, uh, say arts and um, AI or uh, some other combi combination. And I strongly believe that uh, because we are different in this sense uh, from typical university departments and laboratories that are very um, oriented towards one discipline and where everybody comes from the same background, because we have all of these different uh, people in one place, um, I think we end up uh, coming up with more uh, new ideas and, and um, uh, the, the, um, we tend to be very creative because it's actually a lot easier um, to be creative if you are working in the spaces in between disciplines than when you're trying to do something truly novel within one discipline. A second uh, secret ingredient is that um, we tend to, to attract people, again, faculty and students, who are motivated by real world problems and opportunities. People who really don't just want to, say, do great academic research, but who want to have uh, an impact in the real world, who want to um, uh, make a difference through their work in the real world. And again, that actually results in um, a lot of uh, research and creativity and, and uh, inventions that then um, move beyond the academic world and really have uh, societal impact. The third secret ingredient, uh, ingredient is that of iterative prototyping. Um, I personally very much believe that the right way to do um, research, creative research especially, so research where you're trying to uh, come up with um, 
new technologies, new experiences for people to use ultimately, I believe that the right approach for that is to do iterative prototyping. And what I mean by that is that we don't sort of start on a project and plan a year or two years or three years ahead in terms of what we are going to build, but instead we uh, typically start with a concept and a prototype. And the prototype can even be something that doesn't work yet, that is just uh, cardboard or that is just a video that illustrates um, uh, a certain uh, experience or technology that we are trying to ultimately build. And we invite feedback based on that very early prototype. And then based on that, we revise the the initial concept or prototype and build a new version of the system. And we keep doing that and we keep sort of iterating, making our um, prototype gradually more and more um, sophisticated and, and complex, but all the uh, way sort of or the whole time inviting frequent feedback um, on all of these iterative prototypes from target users who will ultimately use the technology um, or the experience, as well as from researchers in our own and in other disciplines, as well as from industry people who come and frequent uh, our laboratory a lot, as you can see in the pictures here. So this whole style of bringing together these uh, very diverse people to uh, work on real world problems uh, in very iterative prototyping uh, fashion has uh, resulted in um, a lot of uh, um, sort of not just papers and uh, experiences and technologies that uh, ultimately get um, um, sort of uh, um, realized in the real world, but also another product uh, is really our alums, the graduate students who come out of our program. And they tend to go on to careers in research as well as academia, as well as entrepreneurship. Uh, you see two of them featured here, my student Pranav Mistry, who is now a senior vice president at Samsung, or Aya Bedir, who um, is the founder of Little Bits, a toy for uh, um, allowing uh, kids to play with electronics in very simple plug and play ways, um, who's there featured on the cover of uh, Forbes magazine. Um, here is another um, spin-off that came out of my research group. Um, we have uh, about probably um, a quarter to um, a third of our students start companies based on the research that they do at the media laboratory, or sometimes that technology uh, that we invent gets um, transferred to uh, companies that we work with. Uh, we even have a venture capital fund called the E14 fund that is affiliated with the Media Lab and that uh, makes it super easy for any uh, researcher from the lab, students or faculty, to start companies. They help with coming up with a business plan, with making introductions. They provide the initial funding so that a student doesn't have to worry about making money right away and getting a job with a company, but they can afford to spend three to six months after they graduate thinking about how they could actually turn their research into a company. And um, that venture fund has been very successful in increasing sort of the, um, yeah, the or making more of our research uh, make the uh, jump sort of from lab prototypes to real world um, uh, products and services. For example, um, on the uh, left here, you see a picture again from uh, a product that was invented by one of my students at the lab. Um, and that was just uh, uh, two years ago voted as uh, best new invention by uh, Time Magazine. Basically, the student was from um, India and as you may know, there is still a lot of uh, pollution in the air in India from um, all of the cars and so on. So he had the idea of 
collecting the exhaust from trucks and buses and basically collecting the little particles, the soot, so to speak, the, that is in that exhaust, mixing that with certain chemicals to make ink, to make ink that can be used as um, for printing, for pens, for paints. Um, and it's now also used uh, in fashion and fabrics. Uh, so that's just um, another example of um, a company coming out of the lab. Uh, we, in addition to um, producing companies, there are many other ways in which we have real world impact. Uh, some of our artists, students will organize exhibits or performances. Um, some other students do a lot of social outreach and create not for profits um, or uh, make free software available, for example, on the right there, you see Mitch Resnick, one of my colleagues, who came up with a Scratch programming language, which is a free web-based programming language for kids, which is now used by over 60 million um, young kids all over the world to teach themselves how to program. On the top left, you see Joy Bulamwini, um, who has been very vocal in uh, terms of uh, alerting people to the dangers of algorithmic bias in AI systems, especially in face um, recognition systems. Uh, she has actually um, uh, um, talked to Congress and the Senate uh, about this. Um, she has influenced um, uh, sort of new um, uh, rules and, and new um, uh, um, uh, adoptions and technologies that um, um, companies such as Microsoft and Amazon and so on have agreed to uh, because of uh, her work pointing out how people with darker skin tones uh, are not being recognized recognized as easily um, by um, AI face recognition systems. Um, on the bottom left, you see Todd Macover, um, one of my colleagues who's actually a music composer and who has been doing, um, who has been integrating uh, a lot of new technologies um, in his um, uh, very <coughs> advanced uh, operas or his operas that that sort of uh, give people totally new experiences by integrating robotics and all sorts of other um, new um, uh, digital technologies. So the secrets of success for the media laboratory are really to summarize that we do interdisciplinary research in close collaboration with target users and industry we aim for real world impact with our work in addition to um, academic success. And we encourage a lot of risk taking and entrepreneurship um, uh, on be, uh, or for our students. Now, that was just a little introduction about sort of the, the context that I work in. So I run one of the 22 research groups at the Media Laboratory, and my group is called uh, Fluid Interfaces. We are very interested in general in coming up with new experiences for people, uh, new ways in which um, yeah, computers and, and digital technologies can be useful in their lives and new ways for them to um, relate and interact with uh, digital technologies. And specifically in uh, the last um, probably five or so years, I've started um, being very interested in one particular uh, sort of real world opportunity. Um, today's devices, today's digital devices are, of course, with us all the time, and they put the, the world's information and knowledge at our fingertips. So I feel that that problem is pretty much solved, sort of, and, and is really a wonderful impact that um, wearable and, and mobile devices are having on our lives. But one question that I'm especially intrigued by uh, these last few years is whether the devices that we carry with us all the time could also help us with self-development and with well-being and with optimal performance. Can they be, uh, help us 
with uh, becoming a, a better or the person that we want to be really. And I think it's clear that all of us uh, to be successful in life, we don't just need that immediate access to information and knowledge, but we also all have sort of issues that we are working on and have to get better at to be um, in order to be successful in life. Things like developing better habits, like healthier habits, or improving our ability to be focused and sustain our, our attention, learning more effectively and more efficiently, becoming a better communicator, uh, being less controlled by our emotions, um, making more rational decisions, or maybe at times being less rational and more creative the topic of uh, uh, or the focus of today's conversation. So the current solutions that people resort to for help with these issues are far from perfect. We read self-help books or we take a class somewhere, um, maybe online or watch a video. We go see a therapist maybe or a coach, a personal coach who can help us with these issues. Or some people... Um, resort to uh, medicine, for example, um, medicine for being more attentive for kids that may have uh, attention issues and more. So none of these solutions are perfect. And I believe that today's wearable devices and today's portable devices, um, our smartwatches, our cell phones, and so on, offer a unique opportunity to maybe rethink self-help, personal growth, and well-being, and um, create new sort of, um, yeah, new ways for technology to help us with all of these problems. So the question I have been focused on is, can we design systems, wearable and portable systems, that help us be successful in life and that help us thrive? Can wearable or mobile devices support skills such as attention, creativity, learning, decision-making, communication, motivation, self-awareness, emotion regulation? The approach that we take in all of our work relies on advances in sensors, AI, and sensory stimulation. Typically, the systems that we have been building will do some real time sensing and modeling of a user, of a person, for example, monitoring physiological data such as their heart rate or uh, their breathing rate or heart rate variability, or maybe uh, brainwave activity, eye gaze, um, uh, muscle movements, uh, uh, gestures, audio, etc. So we monitor aspects of a person and AI then typically processes that data and we issue real-time interventions and feedback to a person to help them in the moment with these tasks that I just talked about, things like learning at attention, creativity, and so on. And we use a variety of modalities to, to provide that real-time feedback, not just visual things like something you look at or audio, but also tact in tactile form, in olfactory form. Sometimes the, the intervention is, is literally pre presenting a smell or scent that can help you be more alert in the moment or that can help you relax in the moment and so on. And the goal is, of course, that these real-time interventions then help a person and uh, with these issues uh, that I uh, mentioned uh, before. To make this more concrete, let me give you some examples and I'll give several in a little bit about creativity and enhancing creativity. But I think all of these ultimately are important to a person uh, being uh, successful and, and operating, uh, say, at their best. Uh, take attention. All of us have problems these days with remaining focused, especially when we're in uh, Zoom calls all day long, listening to talks like this one. <laughs> um, so we have been building a system that 
looks like a pair of glasses. It's still a little bit more bulky than, uh, say, some fashionable glasses you may buy and wear. But our system actually has built-in sensors for measuring EEG or brainwave uh, activity, as well as EOG, which um, is basically uh, the movements of the eyes. So the EOG sensors are positioned here on the bridge of the nose and can measure how your eyes are moving and blinking and so on, we can measure as well. And this system was designed to help people with um, being more aware of their own attention to an external stimulus and helping them with remaining focused uh, externally, for example, to a teacher in a classroom or a talk, uh, like the talk I'm giving right now. And the way the system does this is by in real time, on device processing the EOG or the um, eye movement data, as well as the EEG, uh, EEG data, the brainwave activity data. So we process that in real time and we uh, try to detect whether the person is remaining attentive. And when they are not attentive, the system can give uh, feedback in the form of uh, just a little sound that is played to um, encourage the person to uh, become attentive again. Now, the nice thing, because this is a pair of glasses, is that um, unlike, say, some technology that you would take if you have uh, ADHD, uh, sorry, some medicine you would take if you have ADHD, which um, basically is, is changing your behavior for eight or, or sometimes even 12 hours of a day, the idea is that you can just put these glasses on in the moments when you want to be attentive, but you, when you just want to have lunch, go for a walk, whatever, you can take the glasses off and they won't bother you. And of course, um, one goal is also that maybe by giving this biofeedback to a person, we can actually gradually develop that ability to be attentive and maybe after a while we don't need the glasses anymore because the person has been trained or has been training their own um, brain to be able to be to sustain attention so that they may not need the system after using it uh, for a while. We have been evaluating the system in a variety of contexts. One of them is in a classroom where we had three groups of people um, shown in uh, blue, orange, and gray here. And one group of people in blue, they got the biofeedback from the system. So the system would tell them every time their attention dropped and would remind them to stay focused on the teacher who's not shown in the picture, but there is a teacher in um, the auditorium there. Um, a second group in gray, would get random feedback at different times, uh, telling them to be attentive. And the third group in orange was only wearing the device, but was not getting any little messages like that um, to um, remind them to be attentive. We uh, did three different tests um, where we had people listen to an hour long lecture. And afterwards, we gave people a quiz on the material that was presented in the lecture. And the people who received the biofeedback and got the reminders from the system when their attention um, uh, dropped, they actually performed much better on, answer, on, on the quizzes uh, than the random group or the group that got no feedback at all. We also evaluated this in um, a car simulation system and uh, tweaked the algorithms a little bit to look more at fatigue level, how, how tired the person was. And again, the system would give biofeedback um, every time the, the person was getting um, more fatigued. And we uh, showed that as a result, uh, the drivers that got this biofeedback um, performed better and um, were less uh, falling <laughs> asleep uh, less often um, behind the wheel than the group that did not get the feedback. 
In the area of memory and learning, we've done several experiments as well. Um, one very interesting system is uh, called Nevermind. Um, it was an augmented reality system that we built to help a person with memorizing a list of facts. You may know that people have uh, both factual memory and episodic memory. And it turns out that our factual memory is much less good. So if you have to remember a set of facts that are disconnected, it's actually hard to do that. And you may forget um, that list uh, fairly easily. So what we did in this system is that we used augmented reality te technology to turn uh, the learning of a list of uh, facts into a more spatial task because people actually have typically much better spatial memories. And so um, some of you may, may actually be familiar with um, uh, sort of the, the concept and the theory of the memory palace, which is a, um, a technique that was already used by the ancient Greeks and Romans to memorize very long speeches that they had to give. They would actually, in their minds, create um, a palace, or maybe they would use an existing palace that they knew, and they would tie parts of their speech to places in that palace. And then the way you remember the speech that you have to give is that you just, in your mind again, imagine traversing your palace and you remember what parts of your speech uh, needs to be given in each of the rooms that you in sequence um, traverse. So we're actually using that same concept in this uh, system and I'll explain in a minute how to make it easier for people to learn a set of facts. The set of facts that we took for our test was just um, the subsequent winners of the Super Bowl in um, uh, the US. Uh, the most popular sport is American football. Uh, and uh, um, so we wanted people to be able to recite who the uh, winners were of the Super Bowl, which happens once a year, each uh, consecutive year starting in 1967. And the way we help them memorize this is that we use this augmented reality system to visualize images in their visual field that would remind them of the team um, that won a particular year. And we had our users, our test subjects, um, follow a path that they were very familiar with. In, in our case, it was going from the subway station to their office at the media lab. And all along that path, we would add uh, uh, visuals. Uh, we would augment <laughs> their visual reality with uh, synthetic images to remind them of the different winners of the Super Bowl. So when the person first comes out of the subway, uh, of the subway car, they would see a guy with boxes in the top left because the first year in 67, the Green Bay Packers won the Super Bowl. Uh, that's the name of the, the uh, team. Uh, the second year, the Green Bay Packers won again. So we visualize again a guy with lots of boxes going up the escalator in the subway station. Then when the person comes out of the subway, they see a jet parked um, um, virtually <laughs> um, in uh, the space there um, near the MIT campus because the next year the New York Jets won and then they see um, an Indian uh, chief sitting on the stairs that they pass because the next year the Kansas City Chiefs won and so on and so on. So you will see a little part of the video. You see the augmented reality glasses here. And uh, this woman is just, uh, or student is really just going to her office, to the media lab. But while she takes that familiar route, she will see all these uh, different um, images show up in her visual field to help her memorize um, all of uh, these uh, teams that won. 
we had a control group uh, do the same um, task and they had to learn the, the different winners of the Super Bowl by studying them on paper and they had the same amount of time. And it turned out that right after the group, the control group that used paper, <laughs> uh, as opposed to the uh, experiment group that used our system, which we call Nevermind, right after th these two groups um, uh, learned uh, the set of winners, they actually performed about the same. They both had about 96% accuracy um, on average uh, of the uh, in reciting the different winners of the Super Bowl. But already 24 hours later, the group that learned things from paper had forgotten more than half of um, uh, the, the facts that they had to learn, while the group that used our system, they could just in their mind revisit their trajectory. They would just put themselves mentally sort of in the subway and think, well, what did I see? Oh yeah, I saw a guy with boxes. And then when I went up the escalator, I saw another guy with boxes. And then when I came out of the subway station, I saw a jet. And then when I passed the stairs, I saw an Indian. And so they have, um, uh, they can basically recall the list of winners almost perfectly even a week later, and we didn't go beyond that in our paper, but many of the people who, who did this task um, are still able to recall the winners of the Super Bowl because they have mentally attached these winners to this path that they can easily um, re recite uh, because they're so familiar with that particular route. Uh, Decision making is another area that we've been helping uh, people with. Um, we've been using, again, a wearable device. In this case, it's actually audio-based, not visual. Um, this particular set of glasses um, is manufactured by Bose computer, uh, by Bose, uh, the company Bose, and uh, they have audio output as well as uh, a microphone and a compass and some other information. And we used um, this set of glasses to help a, peep, a person with um, being a little bit um, more critical in terms of evaluating statements that they hear. All of us are constantly bombarded by statements from politicians, advertisements, maybe in meetings and so on. And we're not always thinking very carefully about what we hear. Um, we often sort of just assume that whatever we are hearing is indeed um, accurate or trustworthy information. So we built this um, system called, which we call the wearable reasoner. And it's kind of like having almost a little second brain <laughs> that helps you with evaluating statements and encourages you to think more critically about statements that you are hearing. So we took a whole set of statements and I think there's a picture here, yeah. We had the person listen to them and the device also listens to them. And um, the uh, device actually processes the statements and um, decides whether um, uh, the statement that is made is being supported or not by evidence. And if it is uh, supported, um, it will say so. If it's not supported, it will say so. And in a second version of the system, it also gives an explanation why some statement is supported or not supported. And we tested to what extent when people have this um, augmented reasoning system sort of uh, helping them with um, um, basically thinking about statements to what extent that actually changes their opinions about the statements and changes uh, how whether they think the statements are reasonable um, or not. And what we saw was that there was a significant difference um, in terms of people 
um, changing their opinions about things, specifically when the AI reasoning system would give explanations for why a statement that they just heard um, was uh, supported or not supported uh, by evidence. Creativity, uh, the topic of today's talk. Um, we have been doing a lot of work on augmenting creativity as well and helping people with um, being more creative um, through the use of, again, digital technologies and wearables and so on. A first system that I want to talk about um, is actually, again, influenced or inspired by a very old technique kind of like the memory palace technique that we talked about earlier, um, a very old technique that many people uh, famous for their creativity, both artists and scientists have made extensive use of in the past. People like Salvador Dali, Thomas Edison, uh, Tesla, um, and many more they all used this technique of the steel ball. Sometimes it's referred to that way. Um, and uh, typically they would do this, of course, before computers and smartphones and wearables were around. Uh, they would simply hold a heavy object in their hand while they were falling asleep for a nap, and they would force themselves while falling asleep to think of a particular problem that they were trying to solve. Um, and of course, then when you fall asleep, you tend to relax your muscles. And so the object drops and that then typically wakes you up, um, especially if you make sure that you're falling asleep in a position where that object is going to make a lot of noise when it falls down. And um, so once that object then falls down, that interrupts your sleep or the beginning of your sleep. And that tends to happen um, right in this uh, phase of sleep that is called hypnagogia. Hypnagogia is actually um, a phase of uh, the sleeping process that happens all the way at the beginning of sleep. So when you're just transitioning from being awake to falling asleep. And it turns out that during hypnagogia, people have dreams that are very similar to REM dreams, to the, the sort of vivid dreams that we often uh, uh, remember when waking up. So the hypnagogic dreams are very similar in that they are wild and crazy. And the very interesting thing is that if you force yourself to think of something right before falling asleep, it tends to be the case that, that um, the concepts that you're thinking about, the problems that you're thinking about, they get incorporated in those hypnagogic dreams. And by then forcing yourself to wake up by creating a loud noise, you can capture some of that um, creativity that may exist in these dreams uh, that as it relates to uh, sort of the problem that you're interested in. So Salvador Dali, for example, um, uh, credited this particular picture on the left. Um, uh, he claims uh, came to him in one of these dreams. And there are several other, uh, many other reports from scientists and artists where they claim to have come up with great ideas by using this technique. Now, we thought we would bring this technique into the 21st century and make it a little bit easier for people to use it. And um, we developed some technology that is actually pretty simple. One is just a sensor that you wear on the hand, a glove sort of, uh, or uh, some tape around different parts of your hand. And um, that sensor detects when or what part of sleep you're in based on whether your muscles are relaxed or not, based on heart rates per minute, as well as uh, based on electrodermal activity, which is another measure that you can take from the skin, especially the fingers. And all three of those are correlated with certain stages of sleep, including hypnagogia. So we have a person uh, lying down, and actually before they lie down, they use our app, 
um, and they record a prompt that will be spoken to them as they fall asleep. So if you want to be creative related to a particular project that you're working on, you would record a prompt, um, uh, some voice uh, recording that will remind you of that project and the problem you're trying to solve. And um, once you've created that, when you then lie asleep with a sensor on your hand, your app on your phone keeps uh, reminding you, keeps telling you you're falling asleep, um, uh, remember to think about, and then the prompt is played that you recorded. And then based on the glove sensor, we know when you have entered uh, that hypnagogic phase and we can actually wake you up using again um, your phone to talk to you and uh, wake you up again. And the phone then immediately asks you, tell me what you were dreaming about so that you can capture the imagery that was um, in your mind at that moment. Uh, because often when we write uh, just after we wake up, we have access to our dreams and can we rec recall them. But even five minutes after, they sort of tend to fade and um, uh, we are no longer, uh, we can no longer remember what happened uh, in our dreams. So this, uh, here is a little video that was made by the BBC based on an actual report uh, of a dream of one of our users. Speech about a fork. The prompt was fork. Think about a fork. Putting it in a pumpkin and the speaker agent is using a fork to go into headquarters and a child picks it up and throws it to a bird. So you get the idea. <laughs> we um, can use this system up to five times. So we let people drift to sleep. This, uh, listening to the prompt, we wake them up, we ask for the dream report, we let them fall asleep again, and so on. And we've done that up to five times. So then when the person is done, maybe they haven't exactly gotten a great nap, but they do at the end have five dream reports that they can use um, uh, or that they can replay and that may give them some interesting ideas related to um, the prompt that they uh, gave themselves to think about or to dream about. So we tested uh, this system and um, uh, uh, wrote a paper for the Journal of Consciousness and Cognition. And um, it we showed that um, uh, if we use the prompt tree, the word tree, that um, a very large percentage of people do indeed dream about trees, almost 80%. And we also gave people um, uh, creativity tasks right after uh, using the system. We asked them to come up with alternative uses for a tree. And that is actually a typical um, a test that or measure that is used by psychologists to test creativity. How many different uses can you come up uh, or uh, uses can you think of for a particular object or, or noun? And it turns out that the group of uh, people who used our device and had the word tree as their uh, prompt, they actually were the most um, uh, creative with respect to coming up with new use cases or uh, alternative uses for a tree. And we compared them with a group that just would sleep, take a little nap without being told to think about a tree before they fell asleep, as well as people who just rested but didn't fall asleep and were told to think of a tree while they were resting. As, and then the last group was... Um, the group that stayed awake and was not told to think about trees and they performed uh, the worst. We've also um, most recently been looking at another um, technique for increasing creativity. Um, it turns, uh, there's a concept called the Proteus effect and the Proteus effect 
um, uh, really sort of um, the, the idea is that um, we are all subject to stereotypes and the way we see ourselves um, uh, and the way we see people like us, like in my case, middle-aged women <laughs> or something, that influences our behavior. So what we did was we... Um, uh, took pe we, we had uh, an experiment, we did an experiment over Zoom, where we asked people to um, again engage in that creative users task or the alternative users task that I just told you about. And in one case, they would just see themselves on Zoom as themselves, like the woman on the left there. In a second um, uh, group, uh, or second condition rather, they would see a child version of themselves. Um, all of you are familiar with uh, Snapchat filters and we simply use the Snapchat fil filter to turn uh, this uh, young woman into an even younger woman. And then last, we also had people perform the alternative uses task when they saw themselves as a crazy inventor. And what is interesting is that um, we actually showed that when, um, so we had a whole protocol where they would engage in uh, these different um, alternative uses tests for different types of objects that you see there uh, in the middle of the slide. And um, we had them perform surveys and so on. And what we noticed is that when people are in um, uh, the child condition, or which is C, or in the inventor condition, they actually were more creative than um, when they uh, were themselves, were looking at their own version. So this is actually very interesting because um, uh, others uh, actually have used virtual reality to show that if you embody a person as someone else, like you make a male into a female or, or you embody someone in VR as someone of a different race or something, that actually changes people's behavior and people's attitudes, not just during the virtual reality experience, but also afterwards when they come back to their normal life, their um, behavior and their opinions have been changed a little bit because they have in virtual reality um, been someone else, basically been, um, say, a male when you're a female or someone of a different race and so on. And so we think it's very interesting that um, it looks like the use of Snapchat filters uh, may have that same effect that when you start seeing yourself on Snapchat as a different gender, different race and so on that starts changing your opinions and your behavior. So it's a, a fascinating way uh, for us to um, allow people to really, um, yeah, explore more broadly who they could be and, and see more possibility uh, for themselves. Last example I'll give is from communication. We think people can often use help with uh, better communication, especially more empathetic uh, communication. For example, in workplace teams, it's important that teams can collaborate well together by being great communicators, great listeners, uh, doctor-patient um, relationships are, and outcomes, patient outcomes are much better when doctors can really communicate empathetically. Of course, couples do better um, if they can uh, have a really good communication uh, amongst themselves. And so we have been looking at to what extent we can help people with uh, developing some of these empathetic communication skills by using again these wearable devices uh, that we that I showed throughout the talk. So we actually, sorry, um, built a device uh, that you see on the left there that just uses electrodermal activity as the uh, 
a measure that it senses and processes in real time. And electrodermal activity is really, um, a, a, gives you a good sense of how excited a person is about something at a particular time. Um, but they may be positively or negatively excited in that moment. You don't know what their, uh, the, the valence um, uh, basically is. Um, you only know the arousal. Um, it's called the arousal. And so what we did in this system was that we gave people feedback about the electrodermal activity or EDA of their conversation partner. So to what extent is the conversation partner, get, do they get like a little bit more excited about something uh, that you are saying? And um, uh, we give you information about that. And we gave uh, romantic couples, or we tested this with romantic couples, gave them very sensitive conversation topics to talk about. Um, and we um, uh, give, gave them the feedback about how the other person was responding. And it turns out that um, by having this feedback channel about the electrodermal activity of your conversation partner, um, we showed that that actually changed the nature of the conversation and people became um, or showed an increased level of attention and awareness uh, of themselves and how they were talking and the other per person. Um, for example, they used more perceptual words like feel, see, hear. They asked more questions because, of course, when the other person was responding uh, strongly to something that was being said, they would ask like, oh, does that upset you or something? Uh, they used the words we more often than I, and they also used more social words. These are all um, ways that people evaluate how empathetic uh, conversations are. And we showed in this uh, paper, basically, and in this experiment, that this technology can help with um, improving the uh, empathy level in communication. So I want to end there and say, um, I hope I have uh, convinced you that uh, these wearable devices can go way beyond giving us information and knowledge that they can help us with some of these more important skills uh, that uh, help us grow and thrive, things like creativity, attention, communication, and so on. And we do so by using sensor data and AI techniques and uh, taking a lot of inspiration from uh, psychology um, in uh, sort of uh, how people uh, think and process things and how, um, uh, yeah, and that influences uh, the systems that we built. I want to end by an important slide saying that um, we think a lot about and talk a lot about the ethics of these systems that we built. Um, all of the systems that we built, they of course uh, gather a lot of private data about a person, physiological data, brain data, and so on. Um, and uh, it is important that that data is kept private. Um, one method that we use is that we keep it very local. Uh, we try to always do local processing on devices that aren't even networked so that nobody has that access to the data, for example, on how often you need reminders to be attentive. Um, we also design these systems with target users, which we think is very important to be sensitive to their needs and their responses to these technologies. Our goal is always to enable people and to empower them, but never to enforce something. So uh, we just want to give people more tools to help themselves with being more attentive, with being more creative, with being better communicators. Um, but we would never want to um, force people to use these technologies. And last, I want to say that in all of these systems, we try to teach people to become better communicators, more attentive people to, we 
teaching them how to be creative, etc., rather than making them dependent on these new technologies to be able to uh, fulfill these tasks. So I'll enter and stop my share and, um, oops, I hope I didn't take too much time and I'll be happy to answer questions.